others who haven't done that, who have gone into greed mode. And, you know, one of, one of the things that happened to us in evolution when we gave up communion with the other parts of nature, that in communion, you are transparent to each other. In communication, you can lie to each other, you can deceive. It's a different mode that we're trying out. And because we can deceive each other, a lot of people got away with a lot of things that are now sort of coming to light. And young children are now going back into communion. They can do group mind. Again, it's a mm. birthright of humans. It's coming in. And imagine that one change in the world. What if we couldn't lie to each other? How would the world change? That may be on our agenda, and that'll be big, right? Mm. Um, anyway... The point is that we have that kind of economic collapse because our economies weren't built for, for the well-being of all people, like the king of Bhutan declared the happiness economy, that he wanted his economy measured in, in how happy the people were, how well they were doing. But our global economy at present is not set up that way. It's set up as a profit-making enterprise, and some people lose and other people gain and it's not necessarily good for everybody, so we may have to reinvent that. At the same time, we have global warming coming on so rapidly that we are moving into not an ice age, but a hot age. And I love to talk about how we can live better on a hotter planet. Let's do that. <laughs> How's it going to work? Um, to start with, you know, people have been living in deserts for thousands of years, and many cultures in Morocco and the Middle East and wherever there were deserts, North Africa, um, people learned how to harvest the water that comes down in deluges once or twice a year in cisterns, and they learned how to copy canyons where the sun only is a couple minutes across the street, like Medinas in Morocco, are built with very high walls, narrow streets, and the sunlight just is a couple minutes across, so it stays cool at the bottom in a desert. It's copying nature, copying the ravines, um, harvesting the water the way many insects can do and, and other species, and um, wearing lo loose white clothing, putting reflecting tanks on the roofs of houses, keep them cool in the day, and then at night that water's warm and you can bring it down for a hot bath. Um, in addition, we now have all these new technologies for alternative clean green energies that we can harvest. So we'll have to move cities off our coastlines as the sea levels rise and move them uphill. But are we going to move unsustainable cities to higher ground, or are we going to completely reinvent them? You see, young people today have a glorious future all the time they're being taught to be pessimistic to be scared um you know terrorism scares you and hot age scares you and financial collapse scares you and to me as an evolution biologist these are the signs that we have the opportunity to reinvent everything mm. and that what you're saying is that we're actually learning from the lessons of nature, because nature's had to do this yes. in the past many, many mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. So all the kind of the examples and the, the keys are there somehow, mm -hmm. and we have to look intelligently to see what's happened before, mm -hmm. to see what can happen in the future. It seems to me also that this, this, this potential is latent in us. I was just talking to someone last night at dinner, and they were saying, in the great fire of London, when London was burnt down, afterwards, there was, a, there was a flower that blossomed that no one had seen before mm -hmm. that blossomed because the conditions of the fire mm -hmm. were just perfect yes. for this plant to blossom. And it seems it's a similar thing. Yes. But it's latent in us, but we have to see the opportunity and we have to, like the flower, we have yes. to see this is our chance. Yes. Now we can grow yes. and blossom. Yes. And it's, it's, I want to get into this a little bit because it does seem with, with certainly younger people a lot of the time, that there isn't the initiative after, I was born just after the war, 1946, and mm. things, obviously I don't remember that clearly what happened, but I know for my parents things were tough, and it had to bring out extra spirit, extra initiative, people had to work hard, and there was opportunity to rebuild mm. something, mm. and it seems to me that we've lost this, lost this spirit somehow, which is sad. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you, and, and for Europeans, the World War was a crisis the way 
in the United States, the depression, or all over the world too, that depression was the preceding crisis. I was born into that one. Yes. <laughs> and yes. so my parents also had to roll up their sleeves and work hard to feed themselves and others. They left New York City, moved up into the Hudson Valley with other immigrant Europeans uh, who all developed a division of labor farming community where one had a dairy farm and one had a vegetable farm and one did fruits and honey and one did chickens and eggs and everybody traded around with very little money exchange and we ate very well and I'm a product of a complete depression, right? Yeah, we, it's, we it's local, now, local people food. have forgotten yeah, that, yeah. say, oh my God, we're facing a depression, it's the end of the world. Yeah. The ATM machine won't work, right, yeah. okay? What do you do then? Economies really are about people doing work to feed each other, to make things for each other, aren't they? And so when the money is suddenly gone, people have to go into the mode of taking initiative and building things up. During a war, you have to roll up your sleeves and rebuild, and, yeah. and food was scarce after the war. Now, we haven't had that kind of a crisis until now. Now, nature seems to know that crises are what drive evolution. So what the world should be doing now is absolutely celebrating this crisis and saying, wow, now <laughs> we get to use all these wonderful inventions yeah. we've thought up, the green, clean technologies, the ways of raising organic, healthy food, the ways of freeing farmers from having to be always on the farm by training farm sitters, uh, local economies producing as much of their own food and whatever else they need as possible in case the transportation systems fail us for a while. So this is what we should be saying, how inventive can we be as these bright, creative young human beings if we stop wasting our time and our resources on warfare, on fighting each other, and figure out how do we face these crises together? We have the internet now. The internet permits us to talk to each other all over the globe and share ideas, right? We can work in our global economy, local economies, hands-on, while globally trading our ideas for how to do things. The more efficiently we can do them, the cleaner it is. This is what's exciting now. So if people who are watching this program, who are inspired by you in this very positive way, mm -hmm. What can they do practically? What can they sit down tonight with their family and say, right, yeah. I saw this program today, and I'd really like to do something practical to help change our lives and bring, bring the human race forward. So what can they practically do? Well, the first thing that I think they need to do is let's figure out what is your community? Where is your community? What's the carrying capacity of, of your area? Can you produce food? If not, who's the nearest community that can? And how can you engage in cooperation? Talk, talk, talk. Conversations. They're easy. They're cheap, right? But what they do is weave people together and start strategizing and saying, what if all our schools tomorrow announced that all children were going to imagine it's 2050? and that the world is now sustainable. What does it look like? And then the second question is, what did you do to make that happen? Right? Start to build the scenario. Use this mind that can project, yeah, we want to eat well, we want to eat healthy, we want to have all the consumer things we need, but we want them all recyclable. How do we do it? You know, start looking at what do we want, what do we have to do to get there, and then saying, I'll do this, you do that, you know, let's see how we can cooperate. How can we make the transportation more efficient in our community? How can we make the water supply insure it against drought? Do we need to dig new wells? Do we need to dig cisterns? What is it we need to do to live well if this place becomes drier? Um, you know, there's endless kinds of work to do, and it can be done with enough motivation at we have to be pushed. <laughs> and the value is, too, that it brings people together because one yes. of the things that's happened with the, with well, there's great Lost pluses of the community. computer age and, mm. and, and the internet, but with all these things like Facebook, Facebook and everything, it becomes less personal somehow. You share personal things, yes. but in a less personal way. But this is bringing people back to talking to each other, 
working together on, on, on local projects.